Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're excited to have you on. Today, in this webcast, we will be going over our latest release, 11.3, where we'll have lots of exciting new features. My name is Agnes and I work on the marketing programs team here at GitLab. I'm joining you from sunny San Jose, California today. Also joining us this morning is Tina Strugis from our product marketing team, Dan Gordon from our technical marketing team, and Atar Hamid from our support team. We're going to give people just a couple more minutes to get logged on. While we're waiting, I'm going to launch a poll you can take part in if you'd like. The graphic on this slide may be useful as you think through your answer for this first poll question. Thank you to everyone who participated in the poll. Before we get started, I'm going to cover a couple of housekeeping items. First, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for that. We'll have dedicated time for questions at the end of the presentation and demo, but you can go ahead and send in your questions as you think of them, and we'll make sure to get to them at the end. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can use the chat function to get in touch with a moderator, me, for help. Now I'm going to turn it over to Tina to talk about the results. Excellent, thank you so much, Agnes. I just wanna verify, I had a small technical glitch as I logged on here. Um, can you see the screen here that we have? Yes, it looks uh, great. Excellent, excellent. So unfortunately with my technical glitch, I cannot see the poll results. Um, so can you tell me what we have for our polling results? Uh, looks like um, a lot of people are using GitLab for primarily create, but then there's also uh, a few that use them for verify, release, and manage and package as well. Oh, excellent. That sounds great. So looks like we have a bit of, um, you know, most of the people kind of looking into create. Um, so let's take a look at the reason why I came on this screen is, as you can see, oh, there we go. Now I see it. <laughs> you must have relaunched it. Thank you. Um, so as you can see, GitLab is more than just, you know, sort of our traditional issue board, source control management, and CI, which were the areas kind of where we grew up and we focused on in the past. Over the last year plus, you know, GitLab has really moved toward being a single application around um, for the entire DevOps lifecycle. And that's, you know, pretty much what we've, we've shown here in this um, sort of graphic where you can see all of the nine different phases that we have and, and again we added a little bit of you know since you know 2016 etc to give you an idea of when these functions within the stages were introduced so let's go on to the, the next slide um, let's see I'm just gonna all right all right so one of the areas that we really focused in on um, over the last year here, um, and before we jump in to highlight those new features in GitLab 11.3, let's level set and talk about what is auto DevOps. So auto DevOps is kind of the subset of what we just saw in the previous 
uh, slide here. It's these seven stages of create, verify, secure, package, release, configure, and monitor. Um, these are the ones that actually are basically automated within the pipeline itself, right? So GitLab Auto DevOps eliminates the complexities of automating software delivery. It will automatically help you to set up your pipeline and any necessary integrations that you may have. So we help to simplify and accelerate the delivery with the complete delivery pipelines basically out of the box. You simply commit your code and we'll eventually, you know, we'll, we will do the rest. Auto DevOps, you know, will help you detect the language of the code, automatically build, test, and measure the quality of the code, scan for security and licensing issues, package things up for you, set up the instruments for monitoring purposes, and deploy the application. So, you know, you can understand and look at the breadth of that auto DevOps piece that we have here, and, you know, essentially understand how this can really help to create efficiencies within your software development lifecycle. So on to the next slide, because I know you all, you know, really don't want to hear me go on and on about what the features and functions are, because we know from past experience here that the demo is really kind of where it's at, if you will. But let's talk about sort of the release highlights here and what are the new GitLab 11.3 features. Our main theme this month was around compliance, specifically features that help automate controls around environments and code while furthering efficiencies for Java, Java developers. So um, now, Agnes, if we can, um, can we take our poll now just to see if, you know, we have anyone out there that's currently using um, Maven repositories? We'll just wait a couple seconds for folks to answer. Excellent. So it looks like about 40% um, of our folks out there are using Maven repositories. So this is great because uh, you'll be pretty happy <laughs> with what we've done here with our Maven repositories. Um, one thing to note kind of as, you know, we're, before I move forward with some of these release highlights, um, down at the bottom, you'll see, well, it is the 87th consecutive monthly release we have done here at GitLab. We're very proud of that. Uh, I'm sure this is something that you come to know and love from us uh, having this monthly release. Uh, so for that, you know, we, we are very thankful for our team here at GitLab uh, in and across all, all of the teams here. Um, additionally, at the bottom on the left-hand side of my screen here, you'll see a, a, the URL there. If you want to get any specific uh, details about this release, you can just click on that, um, that URL and that'll take you to the release notes. Uh, super helpful. Obviously, we're, we don't have time to go through everything here today, but this is definitely something that um, you have access to at any time. So um, it looks like, you know, 40% of you guys are using, um, you know, the Maven repository, which I think is great. So you'll appreciate the new capability that we have. And then um, the several of you, the 60% of you who aren't, you know, you know, have a look, check it out. Uh, check around your organization. If other, you know, folks and developers are using uh, Maven repositories, it may be something that they would be interested in. So I'm gonna click this off here. Okay, so let's take a look specifically. Uh, so we have Maven repositories, protected environments and code owners, um, and epic forecasting as our release highlight. So I won't bore you with this screen because I do want to give you right into some details here. So in this release, we've expanded our support for Maven repositories that are built directly into uh, GitLab. We're expanding our support for those Java projects and developers by building that Maven repository. Uh, and staying true with our GitLab values around minimal viable change uh, or MVC, you can expect more functionality and upcoming releases specifically in this area. Dan Gordon, our technical marketing uh, folk here, team member, will be demoing this feature for you today. So I'll try not to steal all of this thunder <laughs> because, uh, but really, you know, this helps GitLab to provide those Java developers with a secure, standardized way to share version control into Maven libraries and save time by reusing these libraries across their own projects. So here's a, a snapshot for you, as you can see here. And again, Dan will be uh, delivering this information here pretty quickly in our demo. Moving forward, um, 
As organizations move toward more automated practices across their SDLC and increase their velocity of delivery, compliance standards and assurance of separation of duties becomes a very obvious area where automation can ensure governance standards are being met. Um, with our protected environments feature that you see here, operators can now set permissions to determine who can deploy code to production environments. This significantly reduces the risk of the wrong person committing something they shouldn't and increases overall security of the environment. So let's go to the next one, which should be our uh, code owners. So code owners is very similar to our protected environments feature here. Uh, we now support the assignment of code owners to files to indicate the appropriate team members responsible for the code. Again, in true GitLab's MVC, uh, we add these definitions, um, we added the definitions into 11.3, and it prepares us for the future releases that will help to enforce internal controls at the code level. Moving on to epic forecasting with integrated milestones, we have um, the last 11.3 highlight, um, specifically around epic forecasting with integrated milestones. If you're using the PPM capabilities that, you, uh, that we have today, you'll know that you've always been able to establish planned start and end dates at the EPIC level. With 11.3, you'll be able to gain insights into potential slippage in EPIC delivery by analyzing the work that is scheduled through the milestones. You will also be able to understand that delta difference, that change between what you thought you could deliver at the EPIC level versus the milestone work that's scheduled to deliver. This will also enable faster, better decision-making on what can be delivered and what plans need to be adjusted. Okay, and then lastly, we have some, some um, additional enhancements, some of which we will um, demo today uh, with Dan. Uh, we have the first one is, if you recall in the beginning of our presentation, we talked about auto DevOps. Um, auto DevOps is that pipeline that automatically is generated. One of the new enhancements that we added into this release is that we are enabling this by default. So um, go ahead and take a look at this feature and function and how it works um, in this new release. Additionally, we have included interactive web terminal for shell and Kubernetes runners. Um, this is, you know, pretty techy feature here and Dan's gonna highlight this throughout his demo. And then we have our, if you're using the web IDE, one of the new features and enhancements that we have there is um, you'll be able to use templates in that web IDE. So myself as sort of a non-technical user of GitLab, um, I love using this new web IDE. So again, if you haven't you know, done this or used this feature within GitLab, you know, definitely take a look at it, especially now that we have the file templates. Lastly, we have in 11.3, we now have the, the SAS support for Groovy as well. So now from my dialogue about what's new, let's take a look and see what Dan has to show us in the demo. So I'm gonna stop sharing Dan and I am going to turn this over to you. Great, thank you very much, Tina. Uh, give me just a minute while I get my desktop sharing set up properly. And as I do that, you might see strange parts of my screen zipping by. Okay, so you guys should be seeing a browser in your window. I definitely see it, Dan. I think we're good. Thank you. Okay, great. So thank you everyone for joining us. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm really excited to show you what we've got here. Uh, I'm going to start with the first thing that uh, that was on the list that Tina talked about, uh, which is the uh, the Maven repository being built right into GitLab. Uh, so this is a Maven compatible binary repository, uh, and uh, we're going to start by just we're sitting on a project here, which just is a, a sample project uh, for for exercising uh, this uh, this new, new capability. Um, to quickly just jump over to this tab here, this is the release announcement that uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, the, and if you go down to the information about the Maven repository edition, 
uh, there is a link to this sample project. So you're welcome to pull that down and play with it, check it out. Um, I did make uh, a few configurations to the project uh, on the way, so I'll point those out. Um, and you can go back and watch the video and see what I did. So uh, in this project, uh, we really have uh, uh, just a few files that let us define what we're going to do with Maven. And then we have a few small source files of really not much consequence because the point is really to show the creation of the artifact and then pushing that into the repository. Uh, I'm going to pop over here to where you would find that binary repository, and that's under packages. So that has to be enabled, uh, both at the instance level and the project level. Once your setup is enabled for that, uh, then you can, you'll can you see this packages. This is a new item on the menu system here. And if we take a quick look at that, let's see right now I have a couple of things in there just to, just to start us out. Uh, really one thing, this is the representation of the artifact, and this is a version of it. Uh, and if we go into that version uh, of, this art of this artifact, I can see that we've got the pretty typical Maven set of information, uh, the, the group ID, artifact ID, the version information. This is really what Maven uses as metadata, as it says here, to find uh, what you're asking for and how you ask for it. But I can also see the files that are underlying it. At this point, I cannot click into those files or download them or get them, but uh, that is something that we are looking at. We do have an issue open for that. Um, and as Tina mentioned, uh, we, we like to work um, in MVC and, and get your feedback and input as you use the, the capabilities so that we can properly steer uh, these features so that they fit exactly what you need. And we continue to build this out. So this is a representation currently of an artifact in the repository. I'm gonna leave that there on that page. And we're gonna go ahead and uh, take a look at some of those files. So I'm going to do that by going to the web IDE because I like it too. I'm, I, I am a VI guy, command line guy, but you know when I'm doing the editing and, and, and whatnot, it, it's pretty handy for a lot of reasons. One is it lets me get to a lot of the files and have them up at the same time with your typical kind of IDE, but I didn't have to set up my development environment. It's all right here on the web. So the source information is where we have our, our files. No big deal. These are, this is our code, the important stuff. Uh, we'll start by taking a look at the authentication, uh, authorization settings, um, which is in the CI underscore settings file. So you add this, uh, this is all kind of typical Maven configuration. Um, the key here though is that you can, by your choice, decide to authenticate by either a personal access token or by CI job token, which is something that our system generates so that you can actually authenticate to the repository using the job token uh, of your current running job. And this, we'll talk, talk about how that gets replaced in just a minute. In the Pong XML, which is also, again, typical Maven configuration, we've set our repository information to point back to our host, and that is the host that we're on, Tanuki host. Uh, and Beyond that, you have, again, kind of your typical sets of information, your, your group ID, artifact ID, um, packaging type, and then here we've got our version information. So this is the 1.0. Uh, so so that, that's pretty much it. Um, again, pretty typical setup. Um, then the magic happens in the CIEMO file. So this is actually what you would write in your pipeline. This is just our little automation to exercise this uh, this feature. Uh, and what we're doing here simply is we're setting up our, our Maven uh, authorization. Um, we're replacing the, uh, the the job token, so the CI token with the, uh, with the information. So we have the authentication information and the project ID. Uh, this was, I forgot to mention that, that was also in the Palm ID. So right now what this does is this creates a red repository per project. And you can go across projects to get that information out and, and get that pulled down into your uh, into whatever you're, you're working on. Uh, but right now it's per project and there is work being done to have it go across projects, have a central, uh, a central uh, 
repository. Uh, and then we, in our exercise here, are going to basically simply do a Maven deploy, which will uh, do all the work to build the artifact and then push it into the repository. So what we'll do here is go to our POM file. We'll do a quick, simple change by just up in the version number. Commit that. And I'm just going to be bad and commit it to master to save everyone the excess waiting. Uh, one thing that you might notice in our CI YAML file um, defining our pipeline, we said we only want to do this when we are doing master branch work. So that prevents us from creating artifacts for every single commit and pipeline that gets run uh, and only creating those artifacts and pushing them into the repository uh, on, on merges to master, to master branch. So another cool thing about the web IDE while we're here is I can see the pipeline right from here. I don't have to go to another page. Um, I can see that, oh, it's actually already done. And what it did was basically pulled everything together, downloaded it, built it, and then uploaded it into our repository. So if we go back to our repository here, And do well. I don't even need to do a refresh. There it is. So this is our our new uh, artifact that's been added, and that you can then now pull out. And the the value of this, of course, is that uh, you know we talk about compliance. You know, uh, if everybody builds and then stores their build artifacts on their local system and then hands those off from person to person, uh, we lose consistency. So the idea of a central binary repository holding the build objects are, is that we can easily share them centrally from a central place and make sure that we know what version we have and that it's effectively immutable um, so that we, we uh, are keeping track of the versions of things that we're working with. Okay, and so that is uh, what we have for right now on our, uh, on, on the, uh, the, the new edition of uh, the Maven compatible repository uh, that's been added into GitLab and uh, Look forward to continuing to see that build out. I knew you would not disappoint on that demo, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tina. <laughs> so let's see, switching now to, to something else. So the other thing that was a big headliner, which I think is really cool, is uh, the protected environment. Now, why protected environment? So GitLab is made so that everyone can collaborate in getting the value of their software changes delivered to customers. And this effort includes operations folks every bit as much as important in that effort as development folks. So, so we've, as he's mentioned, we've been in the last year or so, we've been kind of building out that side of it because we started very strong on the development side and we continue to be, um, but we also want to make sure we have the full end to end. And so part of that is, uh, making sure that we meet the needs of, uh, of the other side of the partnership, which is the ops side. Uh, and that's the reason uh, that we added protected environments. It's important to be able to lock down environments uh, like production uh, to make sure that any changes are well controlled. Uh, we don't want to, uh, to think that the environment is solid and then have some errant change go to it that, you know, takes down the website on the most important day of the, of the year or anything else like that. Um, so just because a developer can write the code doesn't mean that they should be able to change the production server whenever they want. That's going to change depending on the, the culture of, of the organization um, and the maturity level uh, that they're at. Uh, however, uh, there, it's a fact that many IT organizations are required to keep separation of duty so that the code writers cannot be the same people pushing code to production. Um, so we've added the ability to protect environments um, so that that can be managed better. So when an environment is protected, uh, then only approved users or, or groups can execute deployments to those environments. And that's what I'm going to show you here. I'm going to actually switch. So I'm in a particular project, update hello control, well, sorry. I'm in the project uh, Spring App 1. And this is actually the change that, 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 that was made. 
I'm going to switch over. If you, if you notice that, I'm basically just in an incognito uh, window because I'm acting as a different player right now. So I've got two users. There was myself on the other browser window, and there's this guy, just a dev, just as a nice guy. Um, but we don't want him to be able to just push his stuff into production whenever he wants. So here we're looking at a pipeline, an auto DevOps pipeline, actually, that has run its course. Uh, it was set to do automatically everything all the way up to staging uh, and then stop and wait for somebody to roll out to production. And we have the choice of doing 10, 25, 50, or 100% of production at once, so we can manage that as well. But you can see here as, as just a dev here, I've got the ability to press play and actually send it along its way into production. Now, that's not what we want uh, in this situation. So we're going to go ahead and fix that. I'm going to switch back to my user, who is a maintainer of this project. So I have the ability to do this. You can see I also have this ability to go ahead and send it through. But we're going to go to Settings, CI, CD. We're going to go to this new setting for protected environments. Select production and then choose who's allowed to deploy. So I can say groups. So these are groups or roles that are set up or I can pick individual users. I've only got two on here. I'm going to say I'm allowed to deploy, but just the dev is not. And I'm going to say protect. So now it's going to give me that list. So it says, okay, so you've got production protected. Just be aware. Great. And I will hop back to the pipeline. And actually, we don't care about my my pipeline because I, I, I'm I'm still able to to uh, to deploy. But more interestingly, if we switch back over here. So again, we're on on our our dev person, and we refresh their view of the pipeline. They're no longer allowed to uh, to push to production. They can try, but it will stop them here. And likewise here. And also in the other places where usually you can roll a production a, a deployment from, for example, our environment uh, deployment dashboard. Uh, Production has nothing currently. I would normally be able to say, okay, from staging, I want to go ahead and roll out, but I'm not able to do that as this user anymore. Whereas, again, as myself, who is a maintainer of the project, I can here, and I can also do that from here. Oh, we just launched a 25% rollout. Anyway, so we think this is really great. This is super important. Um, Tina mentioned about the, uh, the the work being done to have code owners, which also gives us more checkpoints on the other side of uh, of that of this of this, uh, this dance here. Um, but this is super important for a lot of reasons um, in, in helping to make our production environment stable and helping to keep separation of responsibility. Uh, which, while it's not a legal matter, is uh, one of the most of the standard bodies like uh, uh, certifications like PCI and FISA and all that do uh, look for that kind of uh, do look for that kind of capability. Uh, and we think that uh, this is a cool addition. So moving on next. Moving on next, we're going to talk about the IDE a little bit. So we've popped in now that a few times, but I'm going to spend a little bit more time here, just a tad bit. So I'm in the web IDE. I'm actually going to go back so you can uh, sure. so you can see how I got there. This is just a project. I'm in the project here. And from there, I can jump straight to the web IDE to start working on, uh, on files. Uh, 
if I am in the repository looking at the files, I can actually go into here. That's a real interesting file, isn't it? Uh, right. And I can make edits from here, which is the web-based editing that we've always had. I don't want to do it that way. I can also launch into the web IDE from here. So there's several entry points. If I enter from a file, it will pull it up for me. But the web IDE is great. If you guys haven't seen it, definitely check it out. Uh, we're continuing to add to it constantly. Um, you saw earlier, I was able to pull up the pipeline that was running um, in 11.2, I believe it was, we uh, released the uh, client side visualizing visualization of of, uh, of the code so that you can actually uh, look at and manipulate your your code and see it in the the simulator uh, the code sandbox uh, right in the IDE that's very great stuff so one of the things that we've added here is is we've always had this ability to when you're creating a new file to have a great many templates available to help you get started. And that's been added to the web IDE. So if I wanted to add a new file here, like maybe a license file, I can just simply click on that, give it a name. And we've got four different types of templates right now. The gitlab.gitlab-ci.yaml, uh, which is how we define our pipeline. Uh, and that gitignore, you guys are aware of. Um, license file and Docker files for defining how you build out your Docker images. So since I've said license, let's go ahead and look at that. That's going to take me to here where it's saying, okay, great. So you said license type, go ahead and choose the template. We've got lots and lots of templates. Um, so it licenses in this particular case, right? We've got you know all of the open source licenses and the unlicensed, and whoops, which I just inadvertently selected. Um, lots and lots of licenses and you can search through them here. So Let's say we take that one, maybe we want to alter it. And then basically I've added that file. Once I commit, I've saved it and that's done really easy. Uh, likewise, I can change that. We can look at the different uh, templates we have for defining pipelines. Uh, we have Android pipelines and this is, the, this is actually the auto DevOps pipeline. So if you ever want to see what's happening automatically automatically behind the scenes. This is actually that file that gets run when we run automatically run a pipeline for you. We put this here because totally happy if you want to take this and edit it and make it your own. Uh, add to it, uh, you know, alt, uh, add stages, add jobs, change how it's running. Uh, and so for different languages and different types of, uh, of, of pipelines that you may need, we've got lots of different uh, built-in templates. Same thing for Docker files. Again, how to build Docker images for a lot of different stuff. Now that gets you going pretty fast. I think that's really neat. Now there's one piece here that I've been kind of going past real fast because we kind of stuck it at the top. But you notice there's a couple here, custom Docker one, custom Docker file two, um, in the, in the, the CI YAML files, right? Here's a couple of custom ones. Uh, and this is really neat as well, which is added also in this release, which is not only can you get your developers and all of your stakeholders that are working on, on the code, get, get them going faster by starting with templates, uh, but you can also actually add to the system templates of your own that appear then in, you know, for them to pick. So uh, everything below these custom ones are what we provide, um, but you're able to add in your own. Uh, so, uh, pretty simply, um, by defining, uh, we, we added this capability for doing project templates in the last release, and so now we're also doing this for file templates. So just by defining um, a project space, um, I don't know where it is here, like shared templates is where we actually have the, the project templates, um, and then and then I don't remember where I put the other one, but the the the, the other template space is, is similar, uh, and it uh, let's see if I can find it. Oh, there it is. So the file templates project has been set at the in, uh, at the um, 
at the instance level, the GitLab instance level. And there's a small structure that you can define that where you put Docker file license, et cetera, the kind of files you have, and then you put your templates in there and those will magically show up available to everybody to, to give them a jump start in getting working. Okay, uh, that's what I have to show you today. Um, I think let's uh, switch over to Q&A. All right, I'll take over. Thank you so much, Dan, for the awesome and informative um, demo. So um, I think we have a question come up in the Q&A from Matteo. Uh, Matteo asks, we saw how to publish Maven artifacts how to set up a project to resolve Maven dependencies with GitLab. Um, if anybody want to take that, um, Dan, Athar, Tina. Um, yeah, I can, I can take that. So hi, Athar here. Uh, so we actually only support uh, pushing Maven artifacts to the repository at the moment, but dependency support uh, should be up and coming in the future at some point. Um, it has been discussed on the linked issue in the release uh, blog post. Uh, so that's definitely something that's on our minds. Uh, so yeah, just uh, watch this space. Thanks, Alfred. So, so to be clear, you can reference and pull the files back out, um, uh, but but having a dual the dependency management for you is not there yet. All right. right. Thank you so much, Atar and Dan. Um, I think we have another one uh, from Sai Harsha. Uh, basically, Sai asks, can we do merge and rebase in Web IDE? Uh, you can kick off a, uh, a merge request, um, but at this point, we don't yet have the ability to actually do uh, merges and rebases yet. Yeah. That's, uh, that's something if we hear everybody wants, uh, we will be able to add. Uh, I'll also point out too, while I mentioned that, uh, that this was uh, the web IDE uh, was open source um, separately so that it, so that uh, like everything we do, um, but there's a separate group that works on it as well. Um, and we're always looking for great ideas and, uh, and, and, and contributions as well. But that is something, you know, we are continuing to build out the web IDE. We're adding new functionalities to it um, at every release. Um, and so I think we'll, uh, we'll get there. Sai says, yes, we will love to do a merge in the web IDE. Thank you. Thank you, Sai, for, yeah, for uh, submitting that idea. We will definitely look into it. Um, I think I'm going to close up with just one question that, you know, we often see come up. Um, so uh, can we protect any environment or just production? Um, just so that everybody knows then. Yes, absolutely. So uh, yeah, so we talk about production because that's the one people mostly want to protect, but um, you can absolutely uh, uh, select, see if I have that up here. Um, you can absolutely select any environment while you're, um, that you have defined. Uh, do, 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 do. I don't have it right here. Did I close it? Oh, here we go. Um, so in the definition where you define the protected environment, I, I went through this fast because I, I knew I was going for production, but if I, I click and say select an environment, um, production was one, but it's not available because I've already done that, but I can do all my other environments as well. Awesome, thank you so much, Dan. Um, yeah, I think, in terms of Q&A, if there's nothing else, then we will move on with kind of the next part of this. Um, Tina, would you like to take it away? Yep, sorry, let me just figure out how to get myself off mute again. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, Dan, you're still showing, thank you very much. So um, I just wanted to let you all know that um, I believe it was last week or the, maybe the week before, maybe a week and a half ago, our head of product here at GitLab recently gave a live presentation, which has now been recorded on the product vision for 2019 and beyond. Um, I've put the details up here. It's a blog. He's written a blog on it as well as uh, we have the video. 
up on our website for you to view. So if you're interested on in kind of where we're going, not next month or the month after, but sort of that product roadmap on out in time, uh, please take some time to read it. Um, and see where we're planning to go with our GetLab um, Auto DevOps uh, journey. Um, on that note, thank you very much for your time today, everybody. And I'm going to turn it over to Agnes to close things up for us. Thank you, Tina. You're um, welcome. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's webinar. So please fill out our webinar survey, which I'll drop in the chat. Also, we'd like to invite you to sign up for a free trial of GitLab Ultimate. We hope you are excited to see what your team can do with it. I'll chat that link as well. Tina, um, yeah. Okay. And finally, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach us via our sales contact page about sales. That's all for today. Thank you so much for joining us.